Church, our sermon passage today is from Hebrews 5, verses 1 through 10. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And he says also in another place, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We've been looking at the argument that the writer of Hebrews is making about Jesus being the great high priest. This is really kind of the second part of uh, this passage. We read the whole passage of Hebrews 5, verses 1 through 10. We looked at the first half of it or so last week. We're going to look at the second half today. We're going to kind of backtrack because it's one thing. Uh, This is about the third sermon in a row, though. We've kind of hit on this idea of Jesus as the great high priest. And so this has been kind of a common theme throughout the book of Hebrews. It's going to come up over and over again because As you're writing to the new covenant people of God, it's helpful to know who is the mediator of that new covenant. Who is the one to whom, uh, through whom we come to God? Who is the one who saves us? And so this argument about Jesus being the great high priest is really about that. If you remember, he's writing to persuade these believers that a return to Judaism was a foolish endeavor because the entire existence of the religious aspects of the old covenant are pointing to Jesus be it the temple or the tabernacle or the sacrificial system or the prophets or the kings or especially the role of the priest. All of those things were instituted by God for the people of Israel to keep them within the old covenant. They were means of keeping them from being pushed outside the covenant and, out and keeping them from under, being under the curses of the covenant. It kept them inside the people of God and inside the land. But they were never, the old covenant was never given to change hearts and minds. Right, we read earlier from Ezekiel 36, the promise of the new covenant is one of heart change, of mind change, of the spirit being put inside. That's not something that's present in the old covenant. That's the hope of the new covenant. Another place to go, so if you're looking at, like, where would we see this promise in the Old Testament? Ezekiel 36 that we read earlier, but also Jeremiah 31. And you can turn there if you want, but Jeremiah 31, I'll read it to you. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. The new covenant is, to be a little blunt, new. It's not the same as the old. Nor is it, as some would say, the same covenant with different administrations. It's a new covenant. The book of Hebrews would make no sense if that wasn't the case. The argument for the book of Hebrews is that the new covenant is not just new, but it's, it's not just different, but it's better. It's built on better promises, that God's law wouldn't just be on stone tablets inside the ark, inside the Holy of Holies, but that the law itself would be written on our hearts, that everyone, including the covenant, would know the Lord, no matter where they were from. Their inclusion wasn't based on physical lineage, but on faith. Thus, he can say in that promise in Jeremiah 31, they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. No one will have to be told, know the Lord, because everyone inside the covenant will have already known the Lord. In Ezekiel 36, which we read earlier, we see the promise that God will gather his people from all the lands, all who believe, and he will give us new hearts and put his spirit inside of his people and cause us to walk in obedience. But perhaps the 
greatest promise in both Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36 is the promise that he will forgive our sins and cleanse us from our sinfulness. You see, the Old Old Covenant did not handle sins permanently. Sacrifices were made regularly, and as we saw last week, one day a year, the most important day of the year, on the Day of Atonement, they had to be made for the nation every single year. The forgiveness of the people had to be renewed annually. But the promise of the New Covenant was that sins would be wiped away ultimately and finally in one act. The atonement would be made once and for all time, performed by a sinless high priest. So the promises of the new covenant are better. They're delivered by a better mediator, a better priest, ruled over by a better king, looking forward to a better land, a better country. And the people who would be a better nation, one not constituted of a, of a mix of believers and unbelievers, but all would know the Lord. All would be included by faith, from whatever nation they came from. They would all have new hearts. They'd all have new minds. They'd all have the Holy Spirit inside of them. This is really the thrust of the book of Hebrews. And so constantly, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant are pitted against each other. The Old Covenant exists to get us to the New Covenant. The Old Covenant is inferior. If it sounds weird, if it hits your ears weird to hear that, that's the implication of saying that the New Covenant is better. If Jesus is superior, if the mediator is superior, then what came before was inferior. The old covenant was never, it it served a particular purpose, but its purpose is not the same thing as that of the new covenant. The new covenant is greater, it's better. Better promises, better mediator. And so thus the, the charge to not go back to the old covenant then makes a little more sense, doesn't it? It's a step backwards, It's going back to the shadow of something and not the substance. It's going back to worst promises and worst mediators and sinful priests and imperfect buildings that can be torn down. The primary way he wants, the writer of Hebrews wants to show this truth is by showing us that the old covenant has these inferior mediators, inferior priests. It has sinful men, if if even good men, they're sinful, carrying out a task that cannot provide what we ultimately need. You see, the Old Testament sacrifices weren't bad. They were obedience. But they were simply a temporary fix, a a mere type or shadow to point us what the people truly needed. The priests were not wrong. They just were not the end game. This was all pointing us to Jesus, the true and final high priest, the ultimate mediator and advocate. He's showing us the superiority of Christ and the new covenant made in his blood. It's new, it's better, it's different. Because the Old Covenant was always working toward getting us to Christ, pointing us to our need. So the writer's showing how the Old Covenant priesthood is pointing us to Jesus. Well, look with me, you're in Hebrews 5 already. You can look back and you see in Hebrews 4, verse 14 through 16, that the earthly priest could go through the veil and enter the Holy of Holies. It's one of the tasks, right? On the Day of Atonement, he would go into one day a year, go through the veil, after making atonement for himself and washing himself, He'd go through the veil and and approach the throne, and on that one day a year, he could go into the Holy of Holies. The earthly picture of the presence of God to offer blood on the holy altar, the mercy seat. And the argument the writer of Hebrews makes is, not that's what the, the earthly priests do, but you know what Jesus does? Jesus enters through the heavens. The picture there is through past the veil of the heavens, right into the very presence of God in glory, into God's presence. And what blood does he offer? Well, it's not the blood of a bull or a goat. It's the blood, of his very own blood. His own blood offered on behalf of his people. And he gives full access to God and true mercy. He's a superior high priest who made a superior sacrifice and offers a superior ministry to his people. A ministry that gives them access to God. You know, I don't know if you've ever heard people say this. Uh, I, I've, told this I've told you guys some of my, where I've came, come from ministerially in the past, I, Grew up in a, in a large SBC church. And, uh, you know, one with the kind of flashy music ministry and all that kind of stuff. And I remember hearing people talk about music ministry stuff. Maybe you hear it today where people go, this per- person really ushered us into the throne of grace. Like, oh, what a great job brother so-and-so did. He, man, he really leads us to the throne. And every single time, that drives me absolutely nuts. Because who leads us to the throne? Jesus leads us to the throne. You have access, not because of some charismatic worship leader. You have access to God because of 
Christ, what Jesus did on your behalf. You don't have to have some sort of crazy experiential worship. You, right now, where you're at, not even in this building, you don't have to be in this building. You can approach boldly the throne of grace because Christ is your great high priest. This is the kind of stuff that we're talking about. When, when he's communicating to us this picture of a high priest, understand what Jesus is doing for you. You have access to God in prayer because Jesus goes through the veil for you because he sprinkles his blood for you. He's the one who ushers you into the throne of grace. Someone else might be a talented singer, but they're not, t- they're not doing that. Jesus takes you to the Father. Now, as we move into chapter 5, in verse 1 through 10, we see there are other ways that Jesus' priestly ministry is superior to that of the earthly Levitical priest. The writer of Hebrews really spends the first four verses laying out a few key aspects of the Levitical priesthood. Now, I want you to write these things down. And actually, I said I wanted to write these down, but we put it in the bulletin and the worship guide for you. So if you pull out your worship guide, you see this, and some people are like, we already, you already need to do this more often. Well, that may need a, mean I need to be a little more organized than usual. And so you see this, and you see this outline. Um, the writer of Hebrews spends the first four vers- verses laying out these three aspects of the, the priesthood. In verse one, you see the high priest's priestly nature, right? It's the, the nature of the work of the high priest. In verses two and three, you see the ministry. This is about how they're qualified to carry out that task, the specific ministry on behalf of their people. In verse four, you see the priestly appointment. Who calls the priest? Who appointed the priest? Now, this is all the stuff we looked at last week. I didn't give you this outline because I'm saving it for this week. Because what you want to see here is that there is this kind of um, this structure in verses 1 through 10, so if you label this, you can see priestly nature is basically point A, the priestly ministry is point B, and priestly appointment is point C. Why is that important? Because in verses 5 through 10, the writer speaks of Jesus as the greater high priest, and he does that by following the exact same structure, but in reverse. All right? So let me read for us verse 5 through 10. So also Christ. So verses 1 through 4 is focusing on the earthly high priest. Verse 5. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And he says also another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So from these verses, we see Jesus' priestly appointment, his priestly ministry, and his priestly nature. So the exact things we saw last week, the exact things we see in the first four verses, we see in reverse here. Um, For those of you that are like kind of grammar nerds on this kind of stuff, this is what we call in kind of um, in biblical structure as a chiasm. It's a structure that goes A, B, C, C, B, A, like that. And the reason why is because it's often just... um, it's reference points to prove the greater points either in the second half or even, sometimes even to show the focal point of C, you know, whatever it is that's in the middle there, the, where it kind of folds over on itself. In this case, it's that, it's that first thing I said. It's not that the focal point isn't C. The focal point is that C, B, and A the second time are greater than C, B, and A the first time, right? So A, B, C, the earthly high priest, good. C, B, A, the, the great high priest, Jesus, better. That's the structure. So I don't think there's any extra significance besides that. I think it's just a helpful structural technique to communicate the flow of an argument. And the payoff here is Jesus is superior. So last week we saw the nature and ministry of Israel's priesthood, the appointment of those priests. That's verses one through four. And I drew a lot of conclusions for us. Uh, As you guys can see it, I think you guys can see it coming too, right? It wasn't like I was bringing up aspects of this that you didn't know or you couldn't see where the argument was going. We connected a lot of the dots of this is good, but Jesus is better. Yet today I want to be a little more explicit with that. And we'll backtrack a bit. We'll work from verse 5 to 10, making the connections. We'll connect to A in verse 1 about the priestly nature of Israel's high priest with verse 9 and 10. And Jesus' nature is the great high priest. But to do so, we're going to go from C to A, right? You understand? That's how it's structured up. We're going, we're going to start with verse 5 and work forward so we can follow the order that he's presented in this passage. Now, I also want to note, we're only getting like a small taste of the larger argument. When we read about Jesus' sacrificial work, which is point A in the nature of this, of the priesthood, um, 
What's stated here is elaborated on more in chapter 9. So in a couple months, whenever we get to chapter 9, we'll spend a lot more time on that. So I think, and today we're really going to dig down deep on, verse, on point B. That's where we'll end up spending most of our time. So look with me. We'll start at verse 5 and 6. We'll point C, Jesus' priestly appointment. It's the hinge point of the chiasm, where it, where it turns the corner. Um, we also looked at this last week, so we aren't going to spend a ton of time here today, but I want to draw this connection so we can see the full argument here. As we saw last week, uh, look at verse 5. Look at verse 5. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. As we saw last week, these are two quotations from the book of Psalms. In verse 5, this is a quote from Psalm 2-7. I think it's pretty straightforward. Jesus is declared the son of God and confirmed by the father as son and heir. He's begotten. He's sent into the world as son to be prophet, priest, king, redeemer. Psalm 2, which is uh, a messianic psalm, is extolling the greatness of the Messiah. He's come from God. He's sent by God, not as a mere messenger like a prophet, not even an angel. No, this is the Messiah. He is the son of God. He is God in the flesh. His nature is divine. In verse 6, though, that's, that's verse 5. In verse 6, there's a different focus. He quotes Psalm 110, verse 4. And it's as if he's answering an objection before it even arises. And maybe if you're familiar with, with kind of Jewish structure and, and, and the Old Testament, you might have already thought the same thing. Like, wait a second. How can Jesus be a high priest? He's not from the order of Aaron. He's not from the line of Aaron. How can he be a priest? Is Jesus qualified? Now, we covered this a little bit last week. This is a big passage, this Psalm 110 for the writer of Hebrews. All throughout chapters five through seven, it comes back to it. Throughout the New Testament, they come back to Psalm 110. Mark 12, 36, Mark 14, 62, Luke 20, 1 Corinthians 15, all reference this particular Psalm, this particular verse. And the argument is that Jesus certainly fits a criteria for an earthly priest because before there was ever an Aaronic priesthood, before there was ever a Levite in the, in the place of a priest, there was a priest to whom the father of Israel paid tribute. There's a historical precedent, and it involves Abraham himself, the father of the nation, who we read in Genesis 14, after battle, gives tribute to one who is called a priest of the Most High. He's a king, the king of Salem, Melchizedek, whose name means king of righteousness. He's the, the king of Salem, Salem means peace. He's the king of righteousness, but he's also a priest of the Most High. And this man, this priest king, predates both the monarchy and the priesthood. So if you're thinking through, like, is, is this really a, a kind of a, an exception? Is this a, a precedent that can be set? Well, Melchizedek exists before there was ever kings in Israel. He's, he exists before there was ever priests in Israel. And he exists before there was ever an Israel. And Abraham pays tribute to him, the priest king. And God tells his people through the writer of Hebrews that this event in Genesis 14 is the foundation for God appointing a true priest. Now, think about what the people of Israel would say. It's like, no, 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 the tradition is it's the lineage of Aaron. But can they turn their back on the fact that Abraham did this? I mean, Abraham is the father of the nation. You have you have the people, you have the people um, talking to Jesus. Remember, their, their constant refrain to Jesus is, by what authority do you do all these things? And he's like, I do this on the authority of my father. And they're like, we, you don't even know who your father is, right? They're appealing to the fact that you don't know who your father is. You, you, your earthly father, that, that's been a question mark since your birth. We all know that we've heard the rumors. They're like, he's like, okay, well, who's your father? And there they would say, well, our father is Abraham. We come from Abraham. We are Abraham's people. We are the people of Abraham. To, to say they are they are Jews, is to say they are from Abraham. So if the appeal here to Jesus' priestly kingship is to go, okay, your father, your father bowed down before this man, Melchizedek. He paid tribute to this man. You think Jesus is fit to be king if he's from this line? You think he's fit to be priest if he's from this line? Of course he is. How could the people of Israel ever deny that? Abraham honored Melchizedek. And Jesus is a priest after that order. That's that's the argument that he's making here. Look back at verse 4. 
This is ultimately, by the way, this is ultimately the, the point for us here. On what basis does Jesus serve as the great high priest? The answer is because he was appointed by God. And because God, in his, in his sovereignty, ordained that Abraham would bow down to Melchizedek. So look at verse 4. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So the same God who identified Aaron as the lineage from which the priest is going to come is the same God who identified Melchizedek as the lineage through which Jesus would be a priest. Isn't that a complicated argument? It feels a little complicated, doesn't it? The priestly office, though, must be appointed. And it must be appointed by God. The earthly priest come from Aaron's line is appointed by God. But Jesus was also appointed through being sent by the Father to take on flesh. That's verse 5. By priestly appointment, by the order of Melchizedek, verse 6. So the writer of Hebrews takes these two Old Testament verses these two Psalms, and he puts them together and he goes, you're worried about whether or not, Je- you're potentially worried about whether or not Jesus is able to serve in this role. But he was sent here by God, Psalm 2. And people were like, you're right. And he comes from this lineage of Melchizedek, Psalm 110. And they're like, you're right. So is Jesus appointed by God to serve in this role? And the people have to go, he is. He is appointed to be priest. Jesus is our perfect priest by appointment. And that's the whole kind of hinge point of this chiasm, that the one, the the priestly nature, the priestly ministry, it is all dependent upon the priestly appointment. Who calls the priest to be the priest? Well, God does. Why is Aaron's line the priest? Well, it's because God decided that it would be Aaron's line that would be the priest. And there's more that goes into that, but in fact, that's a great story. I wish we had time to talk about that. Like, what, what of Aaron's lineage made them go, like, this is the priest? By the way, it's because they killed people. Spoiler alert, go back and read it yourself. Just whet your appetite to go back and read scripture. What, what made the priest priests? They were the ones who were willing to slaughter all those who would violate God's word. Just, just saying, the Old Testament is awesome. People are like, oh, this is boring. Like, you, like read the stories, man. It's awesome. Um, like, young men, you want to read some, like, masculine stories? Read the Old Testament. Go read about, go read about um, the, the judges. Go read Gideon, my favorite judge. Go read that story. All right, sidetrack. Got to stay focused. Jesus is our perfect priest by appointment. That's point C, point one for us in the sermon. Point B, Jesus' Jesus' priestly ministry Uh, leads us to this point, right? The nature of his priestly ministry, the description of the Aaronic priesthood, we read in verse two. Look at verse two with me. He can deal, right? The earthly priest can deal with the ignorant and wayward. Now, I, I mentioned last week that ignorant and wayward are covenantal terms for those who commit both intentional and unintentional sins. The priest is able to deal ministerially with both. Why? Because there's sacrifices that are offered up for those who commit intentional sins and those who commit unintentional sins. The ignorant are those who commit unintentional sins. The wayward are those who defiantly commit sin. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he's obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins just as he does for those of the people. Now, verse 2 and 3 are offered up almost matter-of-factly. Right? This is just who the priest is. The priest has to offer a sacrifice for his own sins. That's the nature of being human. He, ha- he is a sinner who needs atonement himself. Now, the task of the priest is, is such that he's a representative chosen from among men. He's to act on behalf of men. And because, why? Because he can relate to other men, to fellow sinners, because they are beset with weakness as well. You see, the ministry of the priesthood is toward the fellow sinners primarily. That's the primary responsibility. They represent, the priests represent sinful people before God. They offer up sacrifices to God for atonement, but they do so on behalf of the people. This is their job. Now, verse 3 reminds us that a sacrifice has to be made for the priest as well, since because of his own, he too needs atonement from sin. That's what we're reminded of the priestly ministry. But then look ahead to verse 7 and see Jesus' ministry. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications. What kind of ministry does Jesus carry out among his people? 
Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. And although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. This was Jesus' priestly ministry on your behalf. On behalf of his people, in the days of his flesh, he offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. He learned obedience through what he suffered. You see, Jesus epitomized this sort of sympathetic ministry. When I say the word sympathy, I think we hear it in, a ter- in the kind of terms of kind of like weak, um, touchy-feely, kind of effeminate sort of thing. You hear sympathy, that's kind of what you, what you think of. That's not what sympathy means, right? The idea of sympathy is to come alongside with someone and to show compassion to them. In fact, compassion is the, is the kind of the, the um, uh, Latin and Greek comparisons, like there's synonyms here. Compassion means the exact same thing as sympathy, right? The same prefix, the same root words here. Sympathy means to come alongside and to show, to show um, concern, to show care for. And so when G- we say Jesus shows sympathy, this isn't Jesus like writing a Hallmark card or just sitting along like, let's have a good cry together. Like, that's not what we're talking about here. It's that Jesus comes alongside and meets the needs of those that are his people, right? So the sympathy shown is not this kind of, like, let me just feel the same feelings you feel. It's let me meet the need that you have. That's what we're called to do. Um, that's, yeah, that is, what, that is what compassion is. The same thing, to come alongside and show that sort of need meeting concern for someone else. By taking on flesh and the corresponding weakness on himself, Jesus literally took on himself the the weaknesses of his people. And he comes alongside us. He dwells among us. And he cares for the needs that we have, not just in a there, there, it'll be better sense, but that he meets the, the, he deals with the problem that we have. What's our problem? It's sin. And he brings the remedy we need for our need. He meets our needs. That's the kind of sympathy that we're talking about. It's the same thing that the priest would do in the Old Testament. It's not that they would come alongside and and just have like a therapy session with with people. They would come in and go, what, here's what, they would tell them, here's what you need. They don't say, tell me what you need. They'd go, here's what you need. You're a sinner. You need this sacrifice on your behalf because right now you are separated from God and the only way you can be kept inside the covenant people is to have this sacrifice made on your behalf. They're meeting the needs of the people. And so that sympathetic ministry is carried out and taken up a thousand notches with Jesus. This is his work in the days of his flesh. From his birth to Calvary, his entire life was lived under the discipline of suffering on behalf of his people, even suffering under death. And the goal of that suffering, verse 8 tells us, is that he would learn obedience. Is that a weird phrase to you? Did that, you read across that, does it hit you a little odd? that Jesus had to learn obedience? Well, this isn't something he lacked in his divine essence. That's, it's not something that he had to learn in that sense. It was something he was earning for his people. This is what we call his active obedience. It's the righteousness of obedience that Jesus stored up that is then given to your account. Do you know that when you are saved, it is not just that your sins are taken away, it's that you're given righteousness. So that when God looks at you, When he looks at your account, your account isn't just emptied out of all the debt that you had. It is now filled up with the righteousness that you previously lacked. From where does that righteousness come? It doesn't come from you. It isn't that you go, okay, I had a bunch of bad things. I had a bunch of red in my ledger. I had a bunch of bad things on my account. God had to wipe that all out. Christ did that. Praise the Lord. Everyone kind of, I think that's how we often talk about the cross is like God wiped all that stuff out. That's half the story. That's true. But it's only part of the story. If that happened and Jesus wiped out all that good, all that bad, where would the good that you need? Without without righteousness, without holiness, no one can see the Father. Where would that holiness come from? Is it that Jesus came along and goes, okay, all your debt's wiped out. It's like Biden taking away your uh, student debt, right? All your debt's taken away. And you're like, okay, great. I still have no money. Where is that money going to come from? Where is that, where's your account going to be filled from? If you just go, I'm going to wipe out your debt, now you're on your own. You think you're going to be able to fill up your account with righteousness? 
all your righteousness is like filthy rags. You can't build up enough righteousness to fill your account with what would be pleasing to the Lord. You need righteousness to be given to you from somewhere else. This is what Christ is learning through obedience. It's not that he's lacking something. It's that you're lacking something that he gains for you. Through his obedience, he, he piles up righteousness that is then given out to his people. Righteousness is put into your account so that when God looks at your account, he doesn't just see, right, the sins have been wiped out, they've been taken care of, they've been paid on the cross. But the righteousness that you have in your account isn't, I saw when you helped that old lady across the street, I saw that. That's, no, it's, this is what Christ has done for you. So what Christ has done for you works in two ways. He removes all the debt you owe and he fills up your account with his righteousness. This is what he's learning, learning in his obedience through his suffering. It's his obedience that earns righteousness that's given away to you. We often talk about covenant theology around here. This is where it's important for us to stand it. God gave a task to Adam, who instead of obedience, listened to the voice of the serpent and the glory that would have been his based on keeping that covenant of works was forfeited. And as our representative, his sin becomes our sin. That's why, by the way, Paul can say, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There was a glory of God that was held out for Adam that Adam did not attain. And when Adam sinned, we all sinned and we all suffered the curse. What's, what hope is there? The hope is that God's chosen son will redeem us, the one who he says, you are my son, today I've begotten you. That this son will redeem us, that he will suffer the curse on our behalf, that he will provide the righteousness demanded by God, that his people may receive the promised hope of glory. And this is done through obedience, but it's not your obedience, it's, it's not mine, but the obedience of the perfect son, the perfect representative, the perfect mediator, the perfect priest who would offer a sacrifice for sin of himself and sympathize with us as our high priest and meet our need by giving us his righteousness. This is what's credited to our account. In fact, in chapter seven, verse 28, he explains this further by saying, the son has been perfected. This too is not saying that Jesus is lacking perfection in his divine nature, which is, is always perfect, but that righteousness was gained through his sinless life. It, it was added to his account to be given to his people. This idea of Jesus as our high priest is covenantal in its very nature. Only those who belong to Christ in covenant relationship receive this blessing. So I want you to hear that, and I want you to feel the weight of that. If you're sitting here today and you don't know Jesus, if you've never trusted in Christ for salvation, you haven't repented of your sins and placed faith in Christ, then what is said of here is not true of you right now. You are under the weight of your own sin. But for whoever calls out to the Lord, he will save them. You cry out to him and ask him for mercy. Your sin will be removed and righteousness will be credited to your account. And you receive more than just that blessing. You receive Christ as your king and mediator. Jesus, your high priest, enduring physical suffering on your behalf. Taking away your sin, giving you the righteousness you lack. As Jesus endured temptation without sin, trusting God and his word, he's providing obedience to you. Because when he did this, none of us in this room had yet trusted in him. None of us in this room had been born. This nation did not exist, right? I mean, when this is happening, this, we are all future. Yet Christ, when he went to the cross, when he lived his sinless life, did that with your name in mind. It's an amazing thing to think about. That as he goes to the cross, he's taking names with him of his people. This is how a high priest shows sympathy to his people. It's taking names. It was, it's not indiscriminate. It's intentional. It's personal. Your sins forgiven. His righteousness given to you. Now, I, I, I've kind of scattershot hit this idea of his priestly ministry in, seven, in verses 7 and 8, hitting on key phrases. I want to point out one other thing here in verse 7. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. Right, we kind of get the other things, that, that he was a son, he learned obedience. That's kind of a general statement describing his, his ministry. But 
when did he offer up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears? And I don't want to limit this only to one place, but it seems certainly that is in mind here is the Garden of Gethsemane. And I think that would be kind of emblematic, maybe even the climax of this sort of earthly priestly ministry due to when it occurs, because it occurs right before his death. So leave, with, leave your bookmark here in Hebrews chapter five and turn back with me to Mark 14, verse 32 is where we're gonna look at. I'm sure you're familiar with this story, with this passage, but I'm gonna keep it in your mind because the writer of Hebrews is saying this is sort of the picture of Jesus' earthly ministry, how he, how he cares for his people. You wanna see how he cares for his people? Here's an example of that. Mark 14, verse 32, and they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he, Jesus, said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began, and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little further, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Here you have Jesus feeling the weight of what lies before him. And what lies before him is his high priestly responsibility to die in the place for his people. This is all ties together here, right? And feeling the agony and the sorrow of the task, he was distressed and troubled. Luke's accounts that he even sweated great drops of blood. Yet as he prayed, he was strengthened and resolved in carrying out the plan that was made before time began. When there was this plan for redemption made within the Godhead, Jesus prayed in pain, but he pursued obedience, the will of the Father. Through prayer, Christ learned and gained obedience. And what does verse seven back in Hebrews five tell us about his prayers? He was heard because of his reverence, his godly fear. This is a rather rare noun in the Greek, but the general idea here is, is this idea of the fear of the Lord that leads to religious integrity. It was Jesus' sinless nature and perfect obedience that allowed him to approach God in boldness and trust that he would hear him. And Jesus, unlike humanity, is without sin and endured suffering and temptation without sin. And so I is looking at his entire high priestly responsibility that included you, that included me. As he's looking at what he's going to be doing on the cross, he knows precisely for whom he's dying. He knows precisely what he's going to endure. He knows precisely what he had to pay for. And he did it pursuing the will of the Father, pursuing obedience. This is an amazing thing for us to think about. We should find an amazing comfort. Do you think this should impact how you then go to your great high priest in prayer? Why do we struggle to pray? Why do we struggle to trust God? Why do we struggle to trust that Jesus himself is now interceding before God for us? Why do we struggle with that idea? Every time, I mean, we know that God hears us when we pray because of Jesus, with confidence that the Lord hears us. You know that every time you say, in Jesus' name we pray, that's what you're appealing to. Like, it's not like a, a magic formula, like God's like, oh, they, they said it. Got through. No, it's when we say in Jesus' name we're praying, we're appealing to this very reality. We're saying that the only reason, God, I know the only reason you hear me is because Jesus is my high priest. And it's in his name that I pray. He's the reason that I can boldly approach the throne. He's the one that brings me into the throne. It's by his nature. It's not, not by that singer. Not by that amazing speaker. It's not their authority or their power, their charisma that brings me to the throne. It's in Jesus' name, it's by the power of Jesus, by his authority, that I can pray and come to you. This is why this, the charge is given back in chapter four of Hebrews, verse 16. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The reason we have confidence is because, not because we offer up great prayers, not because we have something great inside of us, but because we have a great high priest. Do you ever struggle to pray because you think God doesn't want to hear from you? Because you're too deep in your sin? 
Listen to me and be confident. You don't approach God based on your righteousness. If you did, listen, you'd have reason to be in trouble. And maybe that's, what you're, maybe that's the hang-up. Maybe you think, man, God doesn't want to hear from me right now. I've, I've messed up too much. I've, I've been doing the wrong things. I've been not focusing on the right things. My, my life is too astray. God does not want to hear from me right now. I'm too, I've sinned too much to pray. Friend, you're thinking of it exactly backwards. It's at that very moment that you appeal to your great high priest and go, I need help in this time of need. And God offers mercy to me because of Christ. And you go to God in prayer because of his righteousness, not your own. In fact, it's your lack of righteousness that causes you to need to pray in the first place. If it's your lack of righteousness that, needs you, that requires you to go to God in the first place, how can you go, well, I've had too much need? There's no, there's, there's no limit to that. So when in trouble, when in sin, go to God in prayer, confess sin, ask for help, cry out for mercy, trust in him, because, and because of Christ, he wants to hear from you. There's multiple parables that basically tell us you can't wear God out. You can't annoy him. Our sympathetic high priest hears you. And that brings us to our last point. He hears you because of the very nature of Jesus himself. Verse 1 describes the nature of the Levitical priest. You can, look, you can turn back to Hebrews and see this. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation of God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. That's what the, priest, that's what the job of the priest is. That's who the priest is, what he does. What's the nature of them? They're men who act on behalf of other men. They're mediators. They offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. Their task, the very nature of the office, is not just to provide sympathetic ministry, but to take care of the biggest problem that people have, by sin, by sacrifice. And what, Je- and what the Jewish priesthood did in type and shadow, Jesus accomplishes ultimately. Because not only does Jesus' obedience bring us near, it saves us, it pays for our sin perfectly. Look at verse nine. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a priest, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Through his righteous obedience, he saved his people. This is, by the way, Philippians 2.9. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. As the great high priest in the order of Melchizedek, Jesus comes, Jesus becomes the source of eternal salvation. By his perfect obedience, he became both a sinless high priest and a perfect spotless sacrifice. And both of these truths secure eternal salvation for his people. And his salvation, you have to listen very carefully, is not temporal. It doesn't, it isn't imperfect. It doesn't have to be offered every year. When we gather and we take of the Lord's Supper, we're not sacrificing Christ's body. That is a misunderstanding of, of what the Lord's Supper is supposed to be. We don't sacrifice Christ over and over again. That's, uh, that is, by the way, Catholic theology. We don't do that. That's not what we do here because his sacrifice was done once and for all time. He paid perfectly for sin. He purchased sinners by his death. And he holds eternal salvation for his people. His salvation is eternal. It's accomplished one time by one priest through one sacrifice. And his ministry is better because it provides eternal salvation, not just a temporary reprieve. But what does verse 9 tell us about his eternal salvation? For whom is it purchased? To whom is it given? Who is it given to? To all who obey him. The one who earns salvation for his people through his obedience gives this salvation to those who obey him. How does one obey him in this context? It isn't faithfulness to the law. It's coming to him in faith. Those who hear the voice of the shepherd, who see their sinfulness against God, who see their need for a savior, those who hear the message of the gospel, the saving work of this high priest, his life, death, and resurrection, those who hear that message and come to him by faith, for them, they receive eternal salvation. No need for any other savior, any other sacrifice, or any other works. The call to repent and believe must be obeyed. I, I, I try to say this regularly and repeatedly, is the call of the gospel is a, is, a, is, a, is a command. Repent and believe is a command. It's not a suggestion. So those who follow that are obeying Christ. They're coming to him in faith because they hear that command to repent and believe, and they go, yes, Lord. They do that. And for those who believe, they're saved. People get caught up in 
things like election and all that sort of stuff that we often talk about here. How do you know if you're saved? Well, you know if you're saved if, did you hear the voice of God in his word call you to repent and believe and did you respond in faith? If you did, you're saved. Don't stress out about the rest. Church, do you see the incredibly encouraging practical application of this passage? I think maybe you were like me. You come into Hebrews and you go, oh man, there's a lot here. This is heady. It's theological. But these truths aren't just about answering biblical trivia. No, this is about us understanding what our Savior did for us. It's about seeing the greatness of our Savior, the plan of God carried out by the Son, putting on flesh and fulfilling all righteousness and perfect obedience to purchase for, to purchase salvation for the ones who the Father gave him. His obedience purchased salvation. So if you're here and you're trusting in Christ, you've repented of sins and, and believed in him, come to him by faith, this is your great high priest. This is what he's purchased for you. He's taken away your sin. He's given you his righteousness. Church, look at your Savior and be encouraged again that this is your great high priest, the one who is a perfect advocate, a perfect representative, a perfect Savior. The one whose obedience gained your salvation. The one who stands before the throne eternally interceding on your behalf. And so what do you do? Rest in him. Stop striving to earn favor with God and rest in what Christ has done to earn favor on your behalf. Stop thinking, well, I have to stop sinning enough over here to where God will hear me. No, you go to God in faith and repentance by the blood of Christ, by his righteousness, not your own. Your lack of righteousness is what, need, was what causes your need in the first place. So run to him. Place your hope in him. Rest in him. There's no reason to run away from, from Christ and what he offers. You have a great advocate and a great high priest who stands in your place, died for you in your place, and rose from the dead. That's your great hope. So keep your trust and faith firmly on him. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the great work of Christ. May you encourage us and strengthen us as we contemplate what Christ has done for us. Cause us to believe. Cause us to rest. Cause us to trust. Lord, give us faith. Give us repentance. Give us assurance. Give us trust in Jesus, our great high priest. And it's in his name we pray these things. It's by his righteousness that we approach even with this prayer. Amen.